winter and food is hard to come by. Life-giving waterweed lies imprisoned beneath a sheet of ice. Ice breaking becomes a necessity to Britain's largest water bird. Its sheer size helps to keep it warm. Through the short days and long nights of winter, the resident mute swans are joined by trumpet-voiced flocks of hooper swans and Buick swans. These lemon-billed visitors, more sleek in appearance than the mute swan, arrive in noisy family groups. Immigrants seeking shelter from the severe climates of Siberia and Iceland. With the advent of spring, Buick swans and Hooper swans fly to their northern breeding grounds. Only the mute swan will remain to breed on British waters. The female, known as the pen, is smaller than the male or cob, and the black knob on her orange bill is not so large. Swans are superbly adapted to exploit the abundant supply of aquatic plants. The powerful bill is able to tear the vegetation, and horny serrations allow floating particles to be dabbled. Water crowfoot occurs close to the surface and is within easy reach. However, the swan has a great advantage over other water birds. The long, flexible neck allows it to probe far down into the water for food that would otherwise be out of reach. Even greater depths can be explored by upending. In this way, the length of the neck and body combine to allow the swan to feed almost a meter below the surface. As well as feeding on aquatic plants, swans will graze in meadows and fields. During the breeding season, the cobs energetically patrol and defend their territories. This intimidating display, known as busking, is usually sufficiently aggressive to repel an intruding swan, but occasionally clashes do occur. It's always the swan with the strongest territorial drive that comes off best. But little harm has been done 
and it's essential that soiled and ruffled feathers are carefully arranged and restored to their pristine condition. These immature swans instinctively engage in courtship behavior even though they're too young to mate. Further out on the water, pairs of adults are commencing an elaborate and stately ritual. The nest site of the mute swan is always close to water. Although the nest is a large structure, almost any vegetation can be used in its building, and enough material is usually found within easy reach. The pair cooperate over this task, the pen arranging the materials passed back by the cob. These birds will work together in this way year after year, for they are faithful partners. Nearby, a great crested grebe carefully tends her eggs. The mute swan lays the largest egg of any British bird, over 12 centimetres long and weighing the equivalent of about eight domestic hen's eggs. A clutch typically consists of six eggs, all of which have to be regularly turned. The pen fluffs out her feathers when settling on the eggs so that they're incubated against her bare skin. In this way, she keeps them really warm and snug. Although the cob may sit on the eggs when the pen is away feeding, he does not brood them, and the 35 days or so of incubation are the sole responsibility of the pen. Although these big white birds and their large nests are easily seen, they have few predators. The aggressive cob is adequate protection. In the breeding season, they are even prepared to threaten or attack man himself. Waterfowl are well developed when they hatch. It's not long before they leave the nest and begin exploring their environment. Until they're fully fledged, the family of young swans will be carefully watched over by both parents. The young chicks accept as parent the first large moving object they see a process known as imprinting. Successful imprinting ensures that the chicks will instinctively follow their parents.
seems likely that there have always been wild mute swans in Britain, but in medieval times there were many semi-domesticated herds. Swans were highly prized as food. In one case, a feast celebrating the installation of an Archbishop of York consumed no less than 400 swans. Originally, the swan was an exclusively royal bird, but by the 15th century, the right to possess swans had been granted to certain large freeholders. This magnificent tithe barn is a reminder of the Benedictine monks at Abbotsbury and Dorset, who were keeping swans as a source of fresh meat as early as 1393. The swannery at Abbotsbury is an unbroken living link with medieval times. Nests are close together, but the cobs have modified their territorial aggression. This is the only surviving managed colony in the world. The swans are completely wild and unpinioned, and nothing is done to detract from the grace and dignity of a truly regal bird. Her Majesty the Queen! God bless her! The Queen's swan keeper proposes the loyal toast. Swan upping time on the River Thames, a colourful survival from the great days of swan keeping. The Queen and the companies of dyers and vintners still exercise their ancient rights. The chief purpose of swan upping is to capture unmarked swans and nick their beaks to denote ownership. There's one coming out that side. Hold it, hold it. Hold up, Dennis, now. Hold up, Dennis, now. Hold up, hold up. Right up, Dennis. On that boat. Get round, get round there. Then. Get one boat round there. They're going through now. Come on, Pete, that boat. They're going through now. They've gone down the side there. Go on, get ahead there. Go on, Pete, please. Now watch out for them there, don't let them get out. Got enough boats there. Today's simple mark would not have served in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, for the Crown had then granted swan ownership to many people. The old swan rolls give details of more than 900 different swan marks. The crossed keys of St Peter, patron of York Minster. An easily recognised object might suffice, or a device from the owner's armorial bearings. The older marks were often very complex. Swan upping records reveal a stark fact. During the last ten years, there's been a sharp fall in the number of swans on the Thames. Away from the hue and cry, or the relentless invasions of man's activity, some fortunate swans still find clean, peaceful waters. Here, among carpets of water crowfoot, cygnets can explore their new world with all the enthusiasm of young life. The cheeping calls of cygnets and mallard ducklings are essential to their safety. Contact calls keep the family together. Young cygnets have another habit. Rest periods don't last long, for the youngsters have a healthy appetite. Cygnets are not fed directly, but are led to a feeding area where the parents pluck and dislodge food. The cygnets cannot, at first, pull up or sever much food for themselves, but they're forever foraging, feeding on the surface vegetation or from the parent surplus.
There is cause for serious concern about the welfare of mute swans in parts of the country. The low counts of recent swan uppings are not isolated figures. Mute swans have virtually disappeared from some urban rivers and have become less plentiful over large areas of southern Britain. Building, industry, drainage and navigation works destroy breeding habitat and often bring pollution. These are important factors, but the major threat to the mute swan comes from one source, lead pollution. Nowhere is this startling loss of swans easier to understand than on the Avon at Stratford. The flock of about 80 swans that used to delight Shakespeare pilgrims from all around the world has vanished. The elegant white swans of the Avon are today but a ghostly memory as the visitor stares at the empty water. Where has the lead come from? Not from the exhaust gases of boats. Most boats use lead-free diesel fuel. Crowds of holidaymakers on our rivers may be detrimental to swans, but they're not the cause of the serious lead pollution either. Lead poisoning in swans was first highlighted at Nottingham. Swans polluted with oil near Trent Bridge were cleaned by the RSPCA, but nevertheless, many of the birds died. Post-mortems proved the swans had died of lead poisoning. Anglers use split lead shot to weight their tackle. It's cheap, and its malleability makes it quick and convenient to fix to lines. There may be little danger from the responsible angler, but with over two million coarse fishermen in England and Wales, some will be careless. If this lead shot is left on the bank or thrown into the water, it can be a danger to swans. About 25 tonnes of lead are introduced into the environment by anglers every year. Alternative non-toxic substitutes for lead are now available, so one can look forward to a speedy withdrawal of lead from angling. In the meantime, the code of practice drawn up by the National Anglers' Council should be followed. Try not to spill lead. Pick up spilt lead. Take home all your tackle. Swans, like most birds, frequently need to replenish grit in the gizzard for food grinding, but they cannot distinguish lead from grit. Any lead shot on the bank or underwater within reach of swans will be seized. In the gizzard, lead is converted into poisonous lead salts, which then enter the bloodstream with lethal effect. Discarded fishing tackle is also a menace to swans. A fishing hook caught deep in a swan's throat is only one of the many problems that Len and Sheila Baker have to cope with. Together they run the Swan Rescue Service in Norfolk, coming to the aid of swans in distress. Some caught in fishing tackle, others may have had accidents or fallen victims to the mindless cruelty of vandals. Still more numerous are the tragic victims of lead poisoning. Just one swan in over 600 treated by Len and Sheila Baker during the year. Even though lead poisoning has replaced collisions with power lines as the major cause of death among swans, this kind of tragedy still occurs.
Ornithologists, alert to the dangers besetting the mute swan, themselves congregate at Abbotsbury Swannery in late summer, when most of the molting swans cannot fly and can easily be herded and captured. A day of strenuous work is ahead for the wardens and scientists. Checking rings, weighing and measuring are carried out swiftly by a large team so that the swans are not captive for long. Blood samples are important. These are later analysed to determine the levels of poisonous lead. By comparing these with samples taken at many locations around the country and with samples taken on previous occasions, a detailed picture is emerging. Where coarse fishing is intensive, swans have harmful or lethal amounts of lead in their blood. There is no fishing at Abbotsbury. These swans are little troubled by lead pollution and free to seek clean waters. Since the beginnings of history, the image of the white swan has inspired mankind. Today, indifference threatens our swans. Each year, lead poisoning condemns an estimated three and a half thousand of these beautiful creatures to a lingering, horrible death. 